What's up, everybody? We are live. I am Staff Sergeant Stevens. I am Staff Sergeant Malone. And uh, we are a SEER specialist stationed out of uh, Nellis Air Force Base. Um, we're here today to uh, just kind of uh, give you guys some information, answer some questions. Uh, if you're interested in the SEER career field or um, just kind of have some questions, whatever it may be. Um, but yeah, I'm Staff Sergeant Malone. Uh, I was, came from Chicago, Illinois. Go Bears. Rough, rough weekend, but that's all right. Um, uh, I uh, joined SEER in 2011. Um, I was at Fairchild for about six years. Um, did the survival thing in the very beginning, which we can kind of get into once you guys have more questions about that. Uh, did the survival thing for about four years, and then I went into uh, advanced skills training after that for a couple of years, and then taught a little bit of the seven level course uh, for advancing SEER guys in their career. And then uh, just recently got here down in Nellis where we focus on personnel recovery. Um, just to make sure everything runs smoothly, if, in case something bad happens, we can go make sure you guys will pick them up for us. So. Sweet, like I said before, I'm Sar Sergeant Stevens. Um, joined the military 15 years ago as a C-130 crew chief, and about three or four years into it, I'm like, you know what, this isn't for me. So I found out about the career field um, through a couple of pilot friends uh, who went up for, to SVA for um, some SEER training. And I'm like, yep, that is me, that's what I gotta do, that's what I wanna do. So I went. And um, the process was pretty long, so if you guys got questions about retraining into SEER, um, I've got the answers pretty much in my head. Um, the process with the Air Force kind of changed with AFPC and whatnot, but again, if you guys have questions regarding retraining, it um, would be a good time to answer them in the next hour or so. Um, started off at Fairchild like every other SEER specialist does. Worked water survival for three years, which was awesome. Uh, I was able to get my dive bubble, go to school. school and then. Uh, PCS here almost two years ago to uh, Nellis, work at PR. So uh, it's been a lot of, a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, we'll just go through and uh, read some of these questions off and try to answer as many as we can. So let's see, first one I see, we got. Um, so Aiden MCW 1022, if your AFSC doesn't require you to go to the SEER school, can you still go at some point in your career? Um, from my experience, dealing with uh, SV80, you can still go to SEER school depending on your AFSC. So if you're in an AFE job where, hey, you know, it's an incentive, you can go up to, to SEER school, um, you can. And then some other career fields, um, like outside of the realm, maybe support CSS staff used to go up there, go through the, the eight or 19 day course. So kind of just depends on what your AFSC is. So the uh, next question from Lusa Nock, it said, is SEER strictly an instructor job, or do you conduct your own type of missions? Um, primarily, it's going to be an instructor job when you first get in. That will be the first three years that you do is you'll be a survival instructor. It's where you take uh, higher risk of isolation personnel, and you take them out to the woods, teach them how to survive, and on top of a couple other things. Um, and then from there, it's kind of up to you. If you like to instruct, you can continue that path and continue to instruct. Um, if it's not something that you're really that into, um, there are other opportunities as well in the SEER career field where we are right now. Um, the PR shop, we don't instruct that often. It's mostly planning and preparation uh, for personnel recovery. Um, and we basically go out to the field, we do personnel recovery, we're getting picked up, whatever it may be, um, help the PJs out so that way they can get the training and that they need to get done. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities out there more than just as an instructor. But yes, you will instruct in the very beginning. So if that's not something you like, it might not be the career field for you. All right. So uh, Jack R. Scott, are all senior specialists airborne qualified? For the most part, we're all airborne qualified. Um, we do, it, that's part of our upgrade training now from three level to five level. So you will go within uh, the first year of your pipeline. However, things that stop that, injuries, um, any waivers that you may be on at the time. So as long as your class three flight physical is good, you will go to airborne, you will come back static line qualified. Military free fall later on in your career is dependent on um, the needs of the Air Force and the mission that you're, you're supporting at the time. So us here at Nellis, we all eventually will go to military free fall school. Um, but up at Fairchild, it just kind of depends on what your career path is at that point. All right, Austin McCoy is asking, the PJ pipeline takes roughly two to two and a half years. How long does SEER training last and what do you do? Um, so uh, the PJ pipeline taking two to two and a half years. 
That includes everything, including airborne stuff. You'll see a list on the uh, Air Force website. It'll show everything that they go through. Um, so for SEER, this specific SEER training is going to be six months, that's at Fairchild. Um, but before that, you have 19 days at Lackland right after basic training. Um, and it can take up to a year before you actually get your beret, just depending on the time that you get to Fairchild. Because um, there's uh, two classes that we run every year, one summer class, one winter class. So if you're in selection, you make it, you go to, uh, go to Fairchild, you can wait a couple months until you get on to the next class. So um, it honestly depends on how long it may take, but it could take up to a year to get all that training done. And then after that, you have um, certification through um, instruction. And then like uh, Sergeant Stevens already covered, you have Airborne and all the other uh, courses you go through as well, um, just as a basic coverage for uh, being a SEER guy. Sweet, all right. Um, Henderson O'Connor, what is the role of SEER specialist in PR? Um, well, it's a great question for us because that's all we do here is PR. Well, I shouldn't say that's all we do here is PR, but we're mainly focused on PR. So we run uh, the Red Flag Exercise, which is the largest and the best air-to-air -air combat training um, mission in, in the world. So our job here is strictly based on PR, so personal recovery for all of you who don't know what PR stands for. So our job is, at, at the deployed location, is to work mainly at the JPRC or at Saprika which is the Combined Personnel Recovery Agency um, in Afghanistan and other parts of the Middle East. So our job is at the JPRC is just to be that SEER position, basically monitoring uh, C-Cell web app. So uh, that's the combat survivor evader locator radio that pilots are going to have on their aircraft, uh, monitoring different types of uh, radios that are out there. Uh, and then just sitting in the JPRC on the, uh, the COD floor, which is the Combat Ops Division floor, um, just waiting for, hopefully not waiting for something to happen, but if something does happen, that's what we're there for, to liaison through the process of getting a radio contact from that individual that's on the ground to rescue assets in the air to pick that individual up. Um, as far as PR is concerned, back here stateside is to make sure everybody else is knowledgeable on what PR is, what their job is for PR, whether it be the helicopter pilots that are out there, the fighter pilots that are in the air, the ground guys who are out there fighting war, um, and then for other SEER specialists on how to basically pick up that IP or isolated personnel. So that's kind of our role in PR, which is, is pretty huge of the triad between uh, crows, PJs, and SEER specialists. Do you have anything to add on that? Because there's a lot that we do for PR. Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of it's a background. A lot of times when people think of personal recovery, they think of actual physical picking up the guys. Um, that's going to be primarily the PJ's job. Um, we're there just to help support them and make sure that they're squared away and um, they get all the training done that they need to get done and make sure that the people who are isolated are, are squared away as well. Um, so yeah. Uh, another question we got is about selection. There's actually two questions, so I'll answer both of them. <laughs> Sewing. <laughs> Yeah. One's from uh, Jordan Blumberg, and the other one's from Cordova Crystal. Uh, Jordan Blumberg is asking what exactly happens at Medina after BMT, and then Crystal asks about if there's a lot of sewing in selection and should you get familiar with some basics. Um, so for what happens in selection, yes, there is some sewing. It sounds kind of cheesy, but uh, the main idea behind that is just task saturation. Um, it's just giving you a lot of mundane tasks that seem uh, not very important at all, and just to see if someone can actually get through it. Because uh, a lot of times when you have a bunch of things to get done, if people can't organize them together correctly and figure out how to use their uh, appropriate crew resource management, um, they won't be able to uh, complete the task in, on time. So uh, sewing is something that's, that's done. It's, it's nothing too extensive. If you want to get into the basics on hand sewing, you can go ahead and Google it and practice it yourself. Um, but that, that's not going to be the biggest thing. The biggest thing for selection uh, is going to be most of the physical stuff. Um, so making sure that you're good on uh, endurance running, rucking around, you're rucking a, a lot um, all over the place. Make sure that you, uh, you probably, if you're interested in this career field, you've seen the pass test. Um, that's a bare minimum. That's something that you should do as a warm up before you start to work out. Um, if you're going into selection, being able to complete the pass test barely, probably not going to make it out of selection. So um, physically, make sure that you are ready to go completely. Um, endurance is a big thing, rucking is a big thing. Make sure to build up your strength too because you're going to be getting depleted with uh, nutrients and getting a lot weaker too, so. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I got something to add on that. So um, I started running the SEER page, the SEER script page. So 
So if you don't follow, go ahead and follow it right now. It's my pitch. It's uh, USAF underscore Coast here. So uh, if you don't follow that, go follow it. But I've had a lot of questions lately about Rucky because I feel like the, the SOARs, the special operations recruiters that are out there are doing a good job and getting these guys physically ready. Um, but they're still lacking a piece of what to do for the Ruck. So I've had guys ask me, like, what do you do for the Ruck? What, what should I do? The Ruck in, in uh, its selection is 65 pounds. It's four miles, 65 pounds, under 60 minutes. So what I tell guys to do, if you've never rucked in, in your life, grab a Ruck. If you don't have a Ruck, grab a backpack and throw 40 pounds in it. You don't want to go too heavy, too fast. You don't want to just jump, jump on the 65 pounds and just go out there and ground and pound the ground for four miles. Throw... 35, 40 pounds in there, a plate, and then uh, just start off at a mile at a time. See what your mile time is and build upon that week by week, all right? In the next month or so, add the weight, add some distance, and then build yourself up to that 65 pounds because at the end of the day, if you got 65 pounds in your back, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a toll on your body. So make sure you're covering well, um, you're stretching out, and you're doing everything to, to recover. So don't rock every single day, all right? Rock a couple times a week. Um, in the beginning and then get to the point where you can ruck every other day. Because in selection, I'm not going to lie, you're going to be rucking every single day. 19 days, of, you're going to have weight in your backpack or your ruck, uh, whatever you want to call it. So um, start slow with the ruck and then build your way up. So, Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right, so JT Ling asks about um, expectations versus reality. Um, guessing that's in regards to training. Or jobs, we'll talk about both. Um, and also, how is the training for people that aren't that good with public speaking type stuff? So, uh, for the public speaking type, type stuff, um, that's just something that you kind of just have to grow into. I was lucky enough, I when I graduated high school, I went to college for the first two years. Um, ran out of both motivation and money at the same time, so decided to join the Air Force. Um, and that gave me time to mature, um, so I could be more comfortable with public speaking, because I think if I were to join right when I was 18, I might not have been uh, quite as mature enough to be able to make it through, um, be able to get used to the public speaking and everything. But the biggest thing is just getting exposure to it. Um, so if you're not comfortable with it now, it's only going to get worse if you keep pushing it off. Um, so the more that you can do, even just talking to groups of people, like three or four, and just kind of building it up from there, it's going to help you out. Um, if you are going to college, take the public speaking class, practice there. Um, it's going to help you out with that because really the only way to get better is to keep doing it. Like, yeah, so just to put it in perspective, so like, I, man, when I was a kid, I was shy. Dude, I wouldn't talk to anybody, man. I, would, I remember my dad would tell me stories, like, I'd go up and, like, it'd be my turn to order at the restaurant, and I'd just sit there and stare at him, like, dude, I'm trying to order, like, you know what I like to do. So, it was all the way up until, like, after high school, well into the military, where I had to, like, instruct people and give people pointers here and there. So, when I was a crew chief, never had to talk to anybody. Maybe just, like, the pro super on the line, the pilots coming on the bird, like, hey, this is what's good, this is what's bad. That was it. Um, I worked at the fitness assessment cell doing PT tests before I had to like actually talk to people and give instruction on how to do stuff. So um, it, it worked out in the end. And then as a tier specialist, like I, now I'll just go up and talk to whoever. So it kind of worked out in the end. But. Yeah, if you're not good at it now, if you become a tier guy, you'll be pretty good at it by the end. So you can talk to me at anything pretty much. Uh, Warwolf's asking, what different jobs can you get into at Fairchild um, after you get your beret? Uh, so kind of break it down how it works when you get to Fairchild. Uh, once you get up here and you graduate, you get your beret, you go into what's called the field flights. There's four of them. There's Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. And with that, it's teaching survival um, and escape stuff and evasion. Um, and basically what you do is you pick up students, you have them on, the, on base for a week, and then you take them out to the field for a week. You teach them survival and get through everything. And then after that, you have two weeks where it's recouping and then pre preparing for the next uh, next iteration. Um, you do that for about three years, depending on how long your code is. Um, and then once that's completed, that's where you can kind of branch off from there. So like you're talking about, you can go into resistance training, uh, you can do water survival, you can do advanced skills training, um, you can go back into SST, which is where we actually uh, basically teach SEER guys to become SEER guys. Um, what else is there? So just real quick, so pause boys, or pause boy, this is kind of what your question is right now. I think I, earlier I said career path. This is kind of what Sergeant Malone's talking about with different career paths. Um, so not necessarily a career, like different careers here, but career path in here, different different jobs you can work with in the career field. So those are the big, the big ones up at Fairchild. And then basically uh, you got your OSS position, so your operational support squadron. Um, you got 
RQS's, Rusty Squadrons, SDS's, Special Tactics Squadrons, um, just to name a few. So there's different avenues that you can take within the career field. Um, let's see. Scrolling down. Ooh, Netherlands, what's up? See you. Um, uh, awesome. Sunny DVS, so training for the pipeline can feel a bit overwhelming. What advice would you give those who are doing PT for prep? What would your advice for the pipeline itself? Uh, thanks, you're welcome, dude. Rock on. <laughs> um, so PT, like I said, just start off slow. If you're, if you're already an athletic individual, like if you're in high school and you play sports, cool. Just continue on what you're doing, build up from there. Take the advice from the stores because the stores come to us for, so they're the liaison between us and getting into basic training. So these guys have the knowledge base on what it is, what it's going to take for you to get through the pipeline. Um, so listen to what they have to say um, and don't, don't go against the grain and be like, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about because these guys are the hand and the feet of special operations. So these guys go out to our units all right, and then get people like you trying to get into these career fields. So listen to them, start slow, and then just build upon that. Um, first year in general, uh, people are going to make fun of me for, for CrossFit. Do you have a CrossFit, bro? CrossFit. What? CrossFit, bro. Straight up. CrossFit is good. All right. If you don't want to say CrossFit, functionally, functional fitness, all right? You stay functionally fit. So any type of barbell work, uh, fast twitch muscles, um, and just just go for it. Sandbag carries, anything that you're going to carry something, get back strength, um, leg strength with. Uh, but just start off slow and go from there. Second part of that question, advice, hands down, don't quit. Yeah. Don't quit. As long as you show initiative and the will to survive and the will to get better and do do the job, just don't quit. You're gonna be just fine. You're gonna make it through. Uh, Penny's got a short question here. Um, said, very interested to become a SEER instructor. What's the best way to prepare for SEER school? Which you kind of talked about already. Uh, the second part of this is once an instructor, is it difficult to complete college courses? Um, this is one of the cool things about uh, becoming a SEER instructor is you get credits towards an associate's which you can uh, complete, which is pretty awesome. I only had to take, I think, like two or three courses afterwards to be able to get my associate's. Um, and then after that, I'm taking my bachelor's right now as well, and it's all online. Um, I have a lot of time, you know, not necessarily a lot of time, but my schedule's laid out pretty pretty well for me to be able to figure out when I can take classes and when I can't. Um, I'm a junior right now, technically in college, about to become a senior. so. You can definitely complete your college and use tuition assistance. Um, that way you can save your GI Bill for if you ever have kids in the future, uh, whatever it may be. So yeah, college is definitely a, a thing that you can uh, take care of uh, while being a senior instructor. Jonathan, 313, how good does your speaking ability have to become uh, a senior spe specialist in your opinion? Bro, listen to me speak right now. You're fine. <laughs> you're good. Just articulate your words better than me and you're good. Um, Paul's boy again. Do you all have a lot of traveling opportunities? Yes and no. Um, at Fairchild, it varies depending on what what order you're in for upgrade training. So three to five to seven level. Um, as you branch out outside of Fairchild, I I would like to say you have a lot of travel opportunity, uh, different TDYs to go on, different different training events. Um, from here, we go we just stay around like California, Nevada, Arizona, uh, but we still get to travel quite a bit. Um, so yeah, th there's a lot of traveling opportunities within Sear. Um, Jack Tab asked, do you guys have to participate in INDOC? No, we do not participate in INDOC. That's uh, for a separate career field. Um, and then the next guy asked, how common is it to cross-train opportunities into career fields like TACP, PJs, etc.? Happens all the time. We have a lot of senior guys who cross-train. Um, some go into career fields like Intel or whatever, but a lot of guys cross-train into uh, TACP, PJ, Crow, Stell, um, CCT. Uh, so if you find out that you don't want Sear as your career for the rest of your life. You do it for the first four years and then bounce out from there and do something else too. So it's definitely, you definitely have opportunities uh, depending on how long your commit, commitment is um, to switch over. SR Cisco says, hello, handsome. So, so hello, handsome. No, it's not you. Definitely you. <laughs> is it true that you were the last hard class? Yes, Mark Hand 89, 1302 was the last hard class. <laughs> Winter class. Yeah, it was a cross training, bro. <laughs> um, how is it being in Sear while also married? So I can attest to this one. Um, I was married. 
Not anymore. Long story short. So when I was I was married when I went through the pipeline. So being married, you just have to explain to your spouse, significant other, whatever. Um, hey, look, I've got a job to do. And I've got to be focused on this 100%. Because there's going to be nights where you might not come home at all, or if you do come home, it's for two hours, and you got to get right back up and get out the next day. So um, I, I lived on base, so I had base housing, but I also had a dorm room on the other side of the base. So Fairchild's broken up to two sides, Sear side and main side. So I had a house on main side, and then I had a dorm room on, on Sear side. So there, there's some nights where I didn't even bother to go all the way home. It's a 15 minute drive to the other side of base. So I just crashed in the dorm room, got up, stayed with the team. It's very team oriented. I know we always say like, oh, on team this, on team that. Not necessarily a team, like some other career fields, but we go through that team mentality and that team process. So um, being with the team is, is important. Also being with your family is important. However, do know that once you get through training, once you do certify from the field flights and you're, you're in, uh, a certified instructor, Family time will come. Family time will be there, um, and everything everything will kind of fall in place. Like, sorry, Malone's married, kids, and he's got no issues. Doing um, great. Very love you, babe. Very, uh, very family oriented, if you will. Um, got uh, looks like a mom asking. My son is at BMT now, and then on to Sear selection. He's losing some of his conditioning. Do you give them time to build it back up before selection starts? Um, it's kind of a bit of the monster there during BMT. You really don't get in that great of shape. Uh, I lost a lot of my strength and my conditioning when I was going through BMT. Um, that's why you have to build yourself up before you get there. I'm sure he'll be fine. Um, he's just got to muster through. And you got to remember, everyone's going through BMT first and then going into selection. So everyone's yeah. on the same page. Yeah, Chris Soup's mama. Crush it. You're good. He's good. I can't tell you good. <laughs> Chris Soup's mama. Don't worry about it. Um, so we have an interesting question here. I heard the winter classes are much harder than the summer classes. Can you confirm this? Um, the winter classes are much, much harder because you gotta deal with feet and feet of snow and just the cold. Well, and right. you don't have berries. So for summer classes, you have to have- Thanks, Tiffany. Summer and winter classes, you have to have perfectly clean uniforms. The winter time, there's no huckleberries or thimbleberries growing. All right, in the summertime, I was eating all those berries and I was getting them stains all over my uniform. I had to work, work on cleaning them out the whole time. So it makes summer classes way harder than winter class for sure. Winter class for the win. Uh, oh man. Austin McCoy said, physically I feel ready for the path, but how do I prepare myself mentally? Um, if you mean you're ready for the pass, as in like a pass test, you should be able to crush that thing no problem. Um, if you meant that you feel like you're ready for selection, how do you prepare yourself mentally? Just just know that you're going through it with a bunch of other guys. You know, whenever you're doing the workouts, and girls, and girls, and girls, and girls, girls, too, and girls. Yes. All right, uh, but yeah, you're going through. They're right next to you, doing the exact same thing you're doing. Um, that's what helped me out. Just knowing that this guy's not quit for a girl, and quit next to me. So, um, yeah. Just gotta, just gotta muster through. You gotta want this. I am Jordan Blumberg. Right. Do you. When is the next election? So typically, without throwing exact dates out there, it's typically in January and July. So depending on when you go to basic, um, you'll either have to be a holdover student um, and wait for those class days to start. And typically there's between one and five, maybe somebody can that's watching right now that works down there can shout it out. Um, you typically it's between one and five classes per cycle, um, so it just kind of depends on, on the numbers for that, that certain uh, time frame. All right, Spencer Jones asks, once again, my bachelor's degree and later on apply for OTS, yes, is it possible for me to become a stone? If so, uh, do you know anyone who has done this? Uh, I know a lot of SEER guys who cross trains, they got their bachelor's either while they were in or they had it beforehand. Um, and yeah, they, we have, I know a couple guys who went crow and also went stow, so it's definitely a possibility uh, to cross train if that's something that you want to get into. Um, apologize if this answered earlier, but is Sear open to Air National Guard and or reserve members? Yes, it absolutely is. Go to your local state's guard or reserve webpage and then look for those openings is the, the, what I would suggest you to do. Um, it's not only in Washington State, it's all over the place, just gotta look. Joe Dan 88 asks, can you do recycles in the SEER process? Um, 
it's kind of dependent on, on what the situation was when it comes to whether you quit or fail, whatever it is. Um, but basically how it works is in selection, generally if you're quitting at all, they're not going to pick you back up. If it's a medical thing or uh, they had to pull you for whatever reason, sometimes they'll recycle you back through to the beginning. Um, and then if you fail at Fairchild at any point in time, uh, you'll be put back into the next class. You'll have to wait. If you fail right at the very beginning, um, they think that you just maybe aren't mature enough or whatever it may be, um, they'll most likely recycle you back to the next class, which will be six months from then. So give you some time to kind of figure stuff out. Uh, Trample the Week. I like that name. Uh, do you guys, what do you guys think of Go Ruck for Ruck training? Um, I wouldn't necessarily use Go Ruck for like Ruck training specifically for SEER. I love Go Ruck. I love the program. I love to stand for. Um, I've done a few Go Ruck races in the past. Um, but I wouldn't rely on that specifically for Ruck training. Do other things to get yourself ready for that. Um, what up, Dave? <laughs> uh, let's see here. Evan Graff asked if uh, you'll be keeping your physical conditioning up at basic. Kind of talked about this before, um, but just for you guys coming in, uh, you're going to lose a lot of strength and conditioning at basic training. So that's why you need to be well prepared beforehand. Um, so you're going to lose a lot of it in the what's eight weeks on basic, right? Seven and a half or something. Eight weeks. Um, so you're going to lose. <laughs> So you're going to lose a lot of strength and conditioning beforehand. You can maintain a little bit. I know uh, the flight that I was in, it was mostly uh, Sierra one of these that were there. So we had workouts that we do at night uh, after the, the TI rep every single day. So um, you can do things on your own, but it's it's pretty limited. So it's just prison workouts. So um, so you like prison? Yeah, prison. All right, Branson Shrimp, what up? Um, so how many different shops are there in Sierra? Uh, not sure if you guys use that term or not. Yeah, we use that. Uh, we use that term. So, uh, shops meaning like I'm going to the shop. I'm going to work. Uh, we've got a lot of different shops at Nellis. So we've got the OSS, where there's two two guys at the OSS position. Um, there's four guys at the red flag position. Um, there is two guys at the test position, and then there's four guys at the RQS. So there's four different shops just on Nellis itself. Now, unique thing about Nellis is that we rarely see each other. Um, just today, I went over to the RQS for the first time in a while uh, and saw those guys. So it's very geographically separated amongst us. But I mean, at the end of the day, we're still all Sierra Bros, and we always get together when we can, and the mission allows it. So, but yeah, there's lots of there's lots of shops all around the Air Force. So this is a larger one compared to most different bases. I think I finally caught up to the part where I said guys in Sierra. So yeah, there's definitely guys and girls in Sierra. Apologize, Tiffany. My bad. I got you, Ted. General term. <laughs> uh, Sunny PBS asked, uh, in regards to water confidence, I asked you, Greg, so I can swim, but nothing above average. Uh, will we learn as we go, or is there certain things you would recommend working on? Uh, Swimming is not that big of a thing in SEER. Um, it's not like you see with PJs and CCT where they have indoor offers. Uh, mostly done in the pool. Uh, most of our training is done on the ground, where you can still breathe, which is awesome, because I like breathing. Um, so... Swimming, just make sure that you can swim. You can see the pass test. There's, I think it's 200 meters within 10 minutes or something. So uh, just make sure that you can swim. There are times where you are underwater and doing things like that. So, but you don't have to be a uh, college swimmer if you need a little bit of um, All right, so retraining. Jake, 1195, give me, give me more information. Give me some more questions about what you wanted about retraining, and, and I'll come back to it. Uh, because there's very specific things about retraining into into this curriculum that you need to know. So um, give me a little bit more on that and I'll elaborate. Uh, and there's one other one that I just saw in here. Oh, are there civilian jobs available here? Yes, there are civilian jobs available here, primarily at Fairchild. There's some all over the place, Air Force, Army, Navy. All right, but primarily for Air Force here, specifically, we're talking about Fairchild. So there's a few different companies I don't even want to begin to, to say the companies that are out there that are doing that. I think uh, SSI is no longer, I don't want to throw it out there. It's been a minute since I've been up in that, that area. So, uh, but yes, there are uh, SEER positions that um, are civilian type, but you have to have a, a SEER background in the military to get those positions in for the most part. Um, so again, just look at usajobs.org with that. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of opportunities as a civilian getting out. Um, I know guys who did four years as a SEER specialist and they got out and became a contractor um, working with doing the exact same thing, just 
has a different rank and not wearing a uniform, so. Uh, Super Sport Supreme asks, what uh, jobs are you guys? We're Super Specialists, just so you know, anyone else that's coming through here. Uh, so as far as retraining, the first the first process is obviously with anything. It's like you're given your two week notice. I always line it up with your chain of command and tell them, hey, this is something that I'm interested in, something I want to do, um, because we do look at your last three to five EPRs depending on how many years you've been in. So the first step is going on to virtual MPF, going to AFPC, uh, and then hitting that retraining button. That retraining button will walk you through the steps and the processes to initially get that retraining package started. Once you get that packet started in with AFPC, you're gonna get an email back, whether you're accepted or denied, into the beginning processes of that retraining package, and then you'll get um, your forms for your medical, your psych evaluation, um, and then your flight physical. The flight physical, I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna take a minute because there's a lot of things you have to do, a lot of tests, and a lot of people have to sign off on that paperwork for your initial flying class three physical. So that can take up to six months, and then you gotta schedule in your psych evaluation um, and everything else. Once all that paperwork from AFPC is completed and submitted back through the virtual MPF process and the retraining, then it'll go to you guys down at selection, again through AFPC, um, through some of the career functional managers, and then that'll get pushed back um, and then let you know if you have a, a class start date in selection. All right, so once you get that class start date or that seat is what they call it, um, then you'll get your date on when you're gonna be leaving for selection. You'll leave for, from whatever base you're at. You'll, you'll go down to, um, actually they call it um, SST um, IC now. Um, they don't call it selection anymore. So you go down to SST um, IC and then you'll go, you'll go there and then you'll PCA or you're, uh, you'll just go there TDY. You'll go back to your base and then you'll PCS once you get orders up to Fairchild bar and everything goes good at um, SST IC. So hopefully that kind of answers the, the process. Um, might be kind of some, some holes within that story storyline, but uh, for the most part, that's how it's going to go down. Cool. Uh, fellow series specialist Philip Abney asked if we want to talk a little bit about the ops tempo as a series specialist. Um, so it, depend, it kind of depends on where you're located at um, in the career, but everyone goes through the first three years in a, as a survival instructor. Uh, so the ops tempo, when you have students, it's pretty, it's pretty intense, especially when you first start off. Um, becoming a new troop, trying to figure everything out, trying to figure out how to instruct and how to uh, basically time your, or manage your time wisely. Um, so the off tempo is pretty high in the very beginning, and then once you kind of get things figured out, that's when you can kind of have more time, you have a good, decent schedule um, to be able to go to school. Uh, I know a lot of guys who do volunteer firefighting. Um, uh, you, you get into a lot of things, you, you got your, uh, Scott, I have a license, right? Yeah, uh, we got my Class A license. We got Patty, Patty out of it. I mean, there's a lot of different search, civilian search that you can get out of uh, most of the stuff. Yeah, so you, you, the off tempo is high, um, but once you get things figured out and get kind of get your feet underneath you, there's there's definitely downtime. Um, like I talked about before, you have two weeks where you're instructing. Uh, you're not gonna have time to do anything else other than other than instruct, eat, and sleep. Um, and then you're gonna have two weeks of preparing. That's where you kind of. Uh, Take time with your family, take time with further education, things like that. So that's kind of how the off tempo is. All right. Tap Daddy, or no, let's go down one below that. Um, I am Jordan Bloomberg. At BMT, will the MTIs call you out for being spec ops thinking you're all hard and stuff? Well, <laughs> let me tell you this, Jordan Bloomberg, you are hard for going spec ops, all right? <laughs> so don't let them tell you otherwise. However, they will not call you out. That is not their primary job at BMT, is to call you out thinking that you're hard. Their primary job is to get you trained up for the Air Force, not necessarily your job. All right, they may not even know your job. All right, their primary mission in life is to get you trained up to be in the Air Force. All right, so don't worry about them calling you out on that. Um, oh, Mags McDermott, what up? Uh, Josh Scholl asks, why did y'all choose choose Sear? Um, so I guess I'll go first. Uh, the reason why I chose Sear, I. Moved all over the place in the U.S. when I was younger. Um, lived in Illinois for the, like, the last eight years. Um, and I kind of lived right on the outskirts of Chicago. Um, didn't really know much about survival or really anything like that. I was just, just a kid who went to high school and just didn't really know too much about like actual living. Um, and so, Typical. yeah. <laughs> so when I wanted to actually go uh, get into the military, 
first I was in at the army because I don't know, I saw a lot of Band of Brothers and stuff and wanted to go shoot Nazis and everything like that. But um, then my buddy, who was actually in the Army, told me, hey, dude, not a good idea. Look into the Air Force. They take care of the people out there. So I'm like, all right. It's like, but I don't want to do a computer job. And so I go onto the website. First thing I look at is all the careers. And literally the first, like, ten of them was just this dude sitting at a computer with the pictures of each one. I was like, oh, crap. And I started scrolling down. I saw a dude with camouflage on his face, and then it took me out from there. Clicked on the photo, and literally yeah, I was like, I read the description, I was like, that's what I want to do. Did it. A buddy of mine who was a wrestler at a uh, rival high school, he was going through selection at the time, so, um, yeah, I got to get more information from him through there, but that's kind of how I did it, just kind of out of happenstance. Really. You remember that pamphlet that was out, the very first yep. year pamphlet? Yeah, never saw that on the list. One of my favorite senior uh, <laughs> leaders from Sear, back in a way. Congrats on, <laughs> congrats on Chief, brother. Um, he's on there. Oh, dude, that's a text. Oh, nice. nice. <laughs> Rocky Mountain Libra, where is your favorite place to go when you are training others? Me personally, it's hands down Flagstaff, Arizona. I love Flagstaff because we do yeah. cool stuff there. Uh, what was your favorite phase? For me, my favorite phase was probably, man, that's a good question because they're all fun. He likes combatives. My favorite <laughs> phase is probably. Um, open ocean and tropical just because I love the water and uh, it was very difficult. Those phases were very difficult for me so um, I think those are two of my favorites. Yeah, my favorite, uh, shoot, I really liked the combatives part, it was just cool, it was something I really didn't do before. I did wrestling in high school but nothing like uh, MMA style so that was really neat. Um, but in the environments I think uh, Tropics, I hated it the most, but I also learned the most out of it, so um, that was probably my, my favorite environmental. M. Grand E. Have fun at ECAC, brother. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be just fine. Uh, TJ is asking, what sewing patterns and knots should we know beforehand, and what books can we read to pre better prepare ourselves for selection? So, um, Not Bear Grylls. <laughs> yeah. Don't listen to Bear Grylls. Got, he's got good information that he gives out, but he splits himself in crappy situations, and then people do that and they hurt themselves. So, um, so not to know, uh, square knot, uh, trucker's hitch, what else? Overhand knot. Overhand knot, fixed loop, uh, bowling. What else is there? Ten minutes since we tied out. Huh? Uh, <laughs> we do PR here, guys. Yeah. We don't teach survival anymore. So those are some <laughs> of the basic knots, <laughs> right? Uh, sewing, do your flat stitch, know your locking loops. Know your regular loops, and uh, yeah, those, those will get you through at least, they'll teach you the rest of them, but um, know those knots, and then books, I actually bought, I didn't even realize this was the actual book, but I bought the 644, which is the survival handbook for US Air Force, bought that before I joined Sierra, I didn't know that's what they went off of, um, but that's the book that they teach everything off of, it has all the shelters, all the knots, the ones that we missed, um, <laughs> all the sewing, all how to gut an animal, do all that kind of stuff, and it's, it's a pretty sweet book, honestly, and I didn't read through the whole thing, but I looked at all the cool pictures and stuff, so I was at least somewhat familiar with things. Um, so that'd be a good one to go through and read. Maybe get your hands on. I bought it at the local bookstore, I'm pretty sure. So. Amazon. Yeah, and, yeah Amazon. Uh, any news on early retraining waivers since the retraining AFI rewrite? So my suggestion for you is just to go on virtual MPF, grab the um, AFPC 1-800 number. Literally every time I've called that 1-800 number, I've been on hold for less than five minutes and gotten an answer. So just call them up and they can walk you through that process or ask your supervisor. <laughs> uh, Brandon, Branson Tripp asked, what is the most common type of officer you work with, pros though, or is there something else? Uh, so we work with pros quite often. Um, and then for like commanders and stuff, they're generally going to be um, previous flyers um, that we work with. But we work with all sorts of officers, and we train pretty much all the officers that are in the Air Force. So we work with yeah. pretty much everybody. Typically, uh, they pulled AFSOC uh, individuals for Fairchild for us, um, but that's not all the time. It's just been kind of history that the last couple uh, commanders we've had up there. Here, we work for uh, HH-60 pilots and F-15, F-16 pilots, so it just kind of depends on where you're at, what the mission is at your current base. Uh, dropout rate, the dropout rate's been like kind of hit or miss lately. It fluctuates just depending on the weather, I really. I mean, I, I, lately, I don't know. It's it's been up and down. Yeah, kind of depends, honestly. Uh, 
some classes have like 20 guys graduate, generally a summer class, and then some classes have about five or six to graduate. So it just kind of depends on uh, on the group of people. If it's a bunch of uh, Iowa farm boys that's on the team, they're probably not going to graduate. So might be a full yeah. uh, TJ2 and Chelsea Christensen um, previously answered those questions. So this is going to be posted on YouTube probably tomorrow or Friday. So be on the lookout for U.S. Air Force Spec Ops recruiting uh, YouTube page, and it's going to be posted up there, so you can rewatch this whole live feed that's happening right now. Uh, Jake Ji asks, "Are there any unique challenges that guys go through once they get to Lakeland and or Fairchild? Anything you wish you knew beforehand?" Um, I, I wish I would have kind of gotten more into like the actual, like we were talking about tying knots and things like that. So I had to learn all those on the fly because I didn't really know anything other than tying my shoes. Um, so I'll definitely look into the book that we talked about before um, and kind of read it out, get the information from there. But the, honestly, the biggest, they, they teach you everything that you need. So you, you don't necessarily need to prepare for everything, get everything squared away. They're going to teach you everything that you need, and as long as you're paying attention and not falling asleep on them, you'll be able to get everything taken care of. So. Uh, All right, this one. Matt, I've seen you in Spartan Picks. What <laughs> up? <laughs> Can you tell us about your partnership? Absolutely, that's one thing that like kind of hit home to me. So I went through some stuff um, after I got back from my deployment and there's an opportunity for uh, Battlefield Airmen, Special Operations within the Air Force to participate in Spartan races. So for me to get my mind off of what was going on uh, in my personal life, I picked up running and working out. Got super fit and I reached out to one of our career field liaisons who was in partnership with Air Force uh, Spec Ops Recruiting. And they were like, hey, yeah, come on out. See how you do. So I, I went out and I, I did a race and uh, I raced it. And I waited for everybody else at the finish line. Kept waiting, kept waiting. And it was like 45 minutes later, they came through the finish line. And I looked at how I did and I came in like, I think top, it was like top 10, the first one that I did against the elite runners. And then I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Um, I bugged the crap out of, out of one of the superintendents down there. I was like, hey man, I gotta keep doing this. I gotta keep doing this, man. I, I'm gonna keep training, I wanna keep doing this. And then my love for like recruiting went from like zero, because I didn't like recruiters before. And then it went kind of like, like work its way up. Working with those guys, seeing what they did for us or what they do for our career field at the very beginning stages, taking somebody that's straight out of high school and building them up to the point where they're now ready to attempt their very best efforts into becoming a state specialist, a PJ, um, EOD, um, you name it, CCT, uh, TACP. So these guys really drove home like, hey, this is what we do, this is what we, we go for. So uh, SOAR, Special Operations Recruiting, has a partnership with Spartan. Um, and you can, again, go on the YouTube channel and check out all the stuff that the SOARs have done with Spartan and then other CrossFit athletes and UFC athletes um, around, around the U.S. Um, so these guys have a partnership with Spartan, and they pull, I would say, five to six different uh, battlefield airman type positions each race, each mountain series race. Uh, we go out and we race as a team, we build that camaraderie, um, and then we also recruit from there. So it's kind of a unique, uh, a unique TDY to kind of take your time away from your regular job, get the name out there, because a lot of people don't really know about SEER, so it's an, it, it, an opportunity for me to kind of get SEER out there, run my race, do what I like to do, do what I love, and then kind of go and, and bring that bring that all the way back around. So we've also got some really cool stuff up and coming. I don't want to spill the beans too much, but um, today was a pretty successful day on getting some things together for the future. So definitely, definitely, definitely keep keep an eye out for this page, uh, the SEER page, uh, for things coming here to Nellis and some awesome people, CrossFit athletes, UFC athletes, um, integrating themselves in SEER training. So it's going to be pretty cool what we've got coming up. Sandra. I think she's talking to you. You're hard, bro. Oh, that's what's up. Uh, JT Lane said, once you finish the pipeline, will it still be out there roughing it out with your trainees? Uh, answer to that is no. You're not a peasant once you uh, graduate. You actually live a pretty sweet life. Um, how it works is when you're out in the field, you you are roughing it out in the in the field when you're taking the students out doing mobile and everything like that. Um, but once you once they bed down for the night, uh, you pack wherever you want. So you pack your tent, pack wherever you want, or regroup together and live what's called khaki life uh, during the winter time, which is awesome. Yeah, Basically, yeah. just with all your seer bros, 
Um, you got a khaki boss who cooks dinner for everybody. You all get together. You play it's good. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's good. We'll see. But uh, yeah, it, life once you graduate out in the field is awesome. It's like regular camping. Um, you're just teaching some people some cool stuff. Um, but yeah, just minus the booze because you can't drink when you're teaching. So. Yeah. Um, Luker's V. How old is too old for Sear, bro or ma'am? Age is just a number. Uh, I was 27 when I went through. Uh, 33 now. I think 39 is the cutoff. Thir 39 is the cutoff for the Air Force. So um, I, I'm going 30 on 31. So we had a guy on my team. Sorry, Luke, if I'm wrong, but he was 30. I think he was 31, and he crushed it. So uh, age is just a number, man. Just stay healthy, eat right, work out, maintain that, and you'll be good. Uh, Zoe Worth asks, how difficult is it to go through SEER program as a female? I don't know personally, um, dude, but um, I know a lot of girls who've gone through and made it through perfectly fine. Um, they're they're top-notch chick, chicks though, so got to make sure that you're uh, pretty squared away and kick some butt. Thanks, Dave. Um, last class started 36 and graduated 24. My class started 64, graduated 8. Mine was Winter like, class though, so it's harder, obviously. Mine was like 40 and graduated 20, 21, I think. Yeah, so it just kind of depends. Next class graduated, nobody. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's see. <laughs> if Sierra was a high school <laughs> sport, what would it be? <laughs> oh, like, it, feel like it. <laughs> I don't even know, man. It'd be like a little bit of everything. It'd be like a triathlon plus like, I don't know, some other crazy stuff. Um, that's a funny question. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good thought, man. I put some more thought into that. We'll try to come back to that one. Oh, man. No problem. I'm joining the Boy Scouts. And if you do, that's fine. Just don't tell us about it when you come through SV80. Um, let's see. How's Ooh, a reserve question. I'm not an expert on the reserves, so you get with a reserve recruiter on that one. Um, moving around with the reserves, I know it can happen. Um, it's like if your husband's uh, active duty or your reserve is traditional reserves, you guys move. Just get with your uh, local reserve unit and ask them that question. Uh, so Zoe asks, what's a good way to train for rucking if you don't have a ruck? Um, Honestly, I didn't use my backpack when I when I first started. Cause I didn't have a ruck. I didn't even, honestly didn't even know what rucking was or what a ruck was. Um, I had to Google it the first time I heard about it. Um, but yeah, I just used a backpack. I kind of incorporated it in little CrossFit workouts like Matt was talking about. But um, just grabbed my backpack and I threw some weight in. Um, just kind of walked around and see how it felt. Um, but yeah, that's probably your best bet until you actually get a ruck. Um, you can get them pretty cheaply at Army Surplus if you really need to get that. But yeah. You know. um, Amazon has some, some good ones too. Like Forty dollars, just get a Alice pack, the frame, and then I just get pick up a pack. Scab, I know it's you, bro. It's all good, man. Um, hit us up anytime. You got my number. You know when we go out. How about Monday? Yeah. Uh, TJ asks, is the ruck eval on flat terrain? If so, track or trail? The actual eval is on flat terrain. It's like a like a gravel trail type of thing. Um, that's down in selection, um, but that's the only time you're really going to be carrying a ruck on flat terrain this year. Um, so the rest of it's going to be going up inclines that are like this, and then going down inclines that are like this. So um, for the time, time wise, like make sure you're hitting the right time. It's on flat terrain, so train for that first, and then start incorporating elevations. Uh, what's the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Banana slugs, yeah. hands down banana slugs are the yeah. worst. You don't know what it is, Google it. As the minute you put those in your mouth, like they just they gotta let off this like yeah. mucus and it just it gets stuck in your teeth like glued on there. So it's bad. Um uh oh, that's a good one. What's your never quit story? Never quit story. Uh, I graduated. Yeah, like so. what <laughs> what made you want to finish and become a super specialist? Uh, what was your driving factor? So the biggest thing that kind of got me through, um, I can't remember who told me this. It was actually a guy in basic training, but he was talking to somebody else and I kind of overheard him talking. Um, and he was talking about doing workouts and things like that. And he was with his recruiter at the time and they were doing workouts and stuff. 
And he originally was trying to be a PJ, so he was doing underwaters and everything. And uh, on one of his underwaters, he popped early. And the recruiter went up to him and talked to him. He's like, what the heck are you doing? Why are you, why are you doing this? He's like, oh, I just, could, I just couldn't make it. And then he asked him, he's like, he's like, you're married, right? He's like, yep. He's like, how would you feel if I was your wife right now and he saw you pop early and quit? Or she saw you pop early and quit? He's like, well, suck. My wife probably wouldn't do it. Exactly. So imagine either your wife or your mom or your sister, whatever motivates you, whoever is like your inspiration, is there watching you try to quit. And you're not going to do it. So just, that's that's one thing that kind of pushed me through and got me through it. So Yeah, I had, I had a few. Um, <clears throat> I won't get into my personal stories, but uh, one of them is just like, you know, I, I have kids, and do I really want to tell my son or daughter later on, and be like, yeah, I didn't, I, this is what I tried to do in the military, but I didn't because I quit. And I want a lot of them to be like, oh, I didn't make it. So I didn't want to have that factor, be like, yeah, I quit, so I didn't make it. So, um, and the others are just kind of personal to me. But, uh, so yeah, just a few personal questions, or uh, per personal things that happened, and then, uh, so, but yeah, just don't quit. Just find that drive that, that's inside of you and just that motivation. Um, I don't know how to say your name, but you said, how do you get attached to a PJ uh, Guardian Angel unit? Uh, it's actually pretty it's pretty easy. Once you have your code, it wants itself. There are going to be a bunch of jobs that are popping up um, that you can actually apply for. So that's kind of what we were talking about earlier uh, in this interview, where if you want to choose your career path in a different route, you can. So there's a lot of opportunities to get with Guardian Angel. I know a lot of guys who did um, the survival school for the first part, went to an OSS, and then went to an RQS after that. So um, there's a lot of opportunities uh, for you to get into a Guardian Angel, and it's really easy. Uh, we'll work pretty, pretty closely with those guys. Adam, what's up, man? Um, good to see you on your brother. So if you have any questions, you just hit me up. You got my number, just text me. Um, but a good question, so thanks, thanks for blah, blah, blah. You're welcome, dude, love you, man. Um, right now, group training is only open for senior airmen and below. Are there any spots for staffs and above? Um, as of right now, um, no, but in the future, there, there may be. All right, so it's within the needs of the Air Force, so just keep an eye out. Um, and if you're outside that retraining window, sorry, but again, in the future, there, there might be something that comes up. So. Uh, we got about five more minutes on here, so blast off as many questions as you can. Um, in the next five minutes or so, we'll do our best to answer them all. So, uh, Call Tyrone asks, what's the officer equivalent for a SEER specialist? Um, there is no direct officer for a SEER specialist, um, but uh, the closest one would be a, a combat rescue officer. He's kind of in the Guardian Angel weapon system. Um, they, they deal with us mostly. Uh, us and PJs, um, so that, that'd probably be your closest one as an officer if you're trying to with us. They do have to deal with us. Yeah, sure, yeah. There's a question for you, man. What's up? Uh, TJ2 or LL? TJ2. TJ How two. expensive is combative training? Can you later become instructor in combat? All right, so TJ asks, how expensive is combative training? Can you become instructors in combat? Um, so uh, the extensive training, it's it's not, uh, you're not going to become a black belt by the end of it, anyone, anyone who, who says jiu-jitsu or anything like that knows that that takes years and years of training. Um, this training, I think it's two weeks long, and then it builds off on that. Um, in total, training-wise, I think we have about like four months of training by the end of it all. Um, and then from there, you just kind of do continuation training and just kind of roll with guys and stuff like that. But uh, um, extensive training, it just depends on how much you want to put into it. Um, I was lucky and I was able to go into advanced skills training where we actually got to teach combatives um, to other serious specialists. So we had to go to, not had to, but got to go to uh, the Army Combatives program where we become master instructors um, and then brought that back to be able to teach and spin up to your guys. So um, if you want to get into combatives, it's definitely possible. I don't know if you guys know Tyler McGuire. He's a seer guy, he's going, he's going, he's going, he's going intel, so he's kind of a quitter on us, but whatever. Um, he, just, just Google them and it'll answer all your questions that, yes, you can get into combatives and, and really excel in that if you want to as a senior guy. Um, JT Lang, what is a good mile and a half time going into selection? So uh, we have standards that you need to meet. All right, so make sure you know this, what the standard is and then be able to beat that standard. All right, so good times. And I mean, my time when I went through what you call selection, which is now a different name, uh, I was running an 835 mile and a half time but I mean, as long as you can pass that consistently, 
it, it's going to get you through what you need to go through. So, um, yeah. what was your time? Uh, I was You're running yourself. six minute miles yeah, so. for about a mile and a half, so nine minutes for that. Um, that will take too long to answer on this <laughs> slash push up moment. Oh man, I my my funny moments <laughs> are so inappropriate, man. Like, I'll tell a PG version of it. So. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm teaching firecraft, and I noticed that one student, not going to name names, rank, anything like that, is like off in the corner, and I'm like, oh man, like I just keep doing my thing, keep teaching, instructing, and all of a sudden, like, he's just gone in the background. I'm like, alright, whatever. So I'm like going around, looking at everybody's shelter and everybody's fire and stuff, and this guy just comes up, he's like, Sergeant Steven, I, I got an issue. And I was like, I was like, alright, man, well, what's, what's going on, dude? He's like, I, I think. I think I soiled myself. And I was like, I didn't laugh because I, you know, I've been structured in a professional manner. And I said, you soiled yourself? <laughs> like, like you, you pooped yourself? And he's like, yeah, I soiled myself. And I think I might need to change my, my underpants. And I was like, oh my goodness gracious. So I was like, all right, so let, let's take care of this. And this guy takes off his, uh, his Gore-Tex pants and is just blasted with with poop all over the place. And I, I was professional about it. Like, I drove him to where I needed to go, showered up, changed him. Nobody ever found out about that. So we were able to do it. That was like the weirdest, kind of the weirdest thing that ever happened to me in training. But we have so many stories on like yeah. students and uh, uh, students, they kind of lose their minds out in the field for a good reason because they're not used to it. I had one uh, wearing snowshoes out in the snow. First time she'd ever worn them before. And, uh, she had to go take a deuce, right? It's always poop stories. Right? Always poop stories. <laughs> Snowshoes, I don't know if you guys know, but in the back side, they're a little bit longer than your normal foot. So when you normally go to squat, right, out in the field, to go take a deuce, you kind of have your feet pigeoned out this way, but the back ends of the snowshoes cross. Um, <laughs> so when she came back, the deuce had frozen onto the back of the snowshoe and had toilet paper sticking on the side. Nobody noticed. For a while and so we kind of realized that there was a smell while I was teaching and then I kind of leaned over and asked my elm leader, I was like, hey, is that, is that, is that crap on my shoe? I was like, I was like don't, don't bring it up because I don't want to embarrass her. And then he, we're all in a circle, right? And he just stares at her, he's like, ah, that's crap on my stuff too! And just started yelling at her. And uh, she turned all red and everything, but uh, yeah, so that was probably my funniest story with a student. Personally, yeah, man, there's, there's so many. I mean, oh, yeah. but, um, got one in on it. So ride alongs in a fighter jet, uh, again, depending on the needs of the Air Force, where you're at, um, if you do good work, then yeah. Um, I'm still waiting on mine, but I heard the Thunderbirds are going to hook me up soon, so rock on. Um, what events cause candidates to uh, self-eliminate or fail? Uh, pretty much all of them, just due to the lack of sleep, just kind of builds up and makes it kind of crazy. So I think mobile and fam are the two phases that uh, well, that's not what it's called anymore. Uh, mobile or navigation and uh, CSS yeah. com, or course survival skills. Yeah. That's what they change it to. So um, there's one more on here. Let's go. Stand by. Um, yeah, if you guys last kind of last pitch on here. So if you guys have any specific questions on any more SEER related items, uh, again I run the SEER page on Instagram, so US Air Force or USAF underscore go SEER. Is, is me, um, and then obviously you can you can hit up this page too, um, USAF, Spec Ops Stream as well. So, sweet, yeah. I'm not gonna give you my personal page. You can hit me up too, 42.87 <laughs> in school. 